नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सम्मासुद्ध नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सम्मासुद्ध नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सम्मासुद्ध okay so uh, i i give the floor to rajiv you can uh, start thank you bante good day to everyone i know we have people from many time zones i am based out of uh, india it's uh, bang in the middle of the day over here uh, may i request uh, people to turn on their videos i am sure there'll be a lot of smiling faces after the meditation session so it would be good to see everyone okay so uh, today i was thinking uh, we will discuss a uh, uh, it's a very simple but uh, very powerful uh, sutta one of my favorites and uh, there is also an excerpt of this that is pasted at the dsmc main center at missouri so i don't know if any of you have visited but uh, the sutta that i wanted to discuss today is uh, from the majhima nikaya uh, number 58 this is the abhay sutta the discourse to prince abhay on right speech so i'll be using the translation by thanisaro viku so before i begin uh, i'll just give a very uh, brief background to this so i find this sutta to be very connected with uh, something that uh, bante says a lot and he's also written a book about it uh, called life is meditation meditation is life right so it is not just about when we sit what we experience what we see during our meditation sittings what kind of jhanas we see what kind of attainments we have uh, but this practice is actually developing our mind helping us understand our experience of life better and the best reflection of that is in our state of mind right how our state of mind whether it is pleasant unpleasant wholesome or unwholesome through the course of our day through the course of our life and how our actions play out are our actions skillful are they beneficial for ourselves and for others and are they conducive for creating better states of mind in the future for us as well as for others right so that is a very key part of this uh, entire practice it is not just going and sitting and feeling for good for a half hour for one hour in a day or in a week depending on what your frequency is but it is to bring that skill bring that mental development into our daily lives into all our actions and this sutta is uh, specifically on right speech that is the focus of this sutta but it also helps us uh, get a lot of insights on right mindfulness as well as right effort right so let me start with the sutta i'll uh, read it out in in between i will be making some comments uh, that may be relevant okay so abhay sutta uh, translation by thanisaro viku i have heard that on one occasion the blessed one was staying near rajagriha in the bamboo grove the squirrel sanctuary at that time prince abhay went to niganta nataputta So Niganta Nataputta is the name uh, given in these texts for Mahavir, uh, the founder of the Jain sect, and uh, yeah. So a lot of times the Buddha and Niganta Nataputta are shown to have different points of view on you know, specific topics, and uh, these debates or these contests are used as a way to kind of highlight the Buddha's point of view on. many things so prince abhay one of the local royals uh, he went to niganta nataputta and on arrival having bowed down to him sat to one side as he was sitting there niganta nataputta said to him come now prince refute the words of gautama the contemplative and this admirable report about you will spread afar 
the words of gautama the contemplative so mighty so powerful were refuted by prince sabai so nigantanatha putta is setting him up to have a debate with uh, the buddha but how when a rebel sir will i refute the words of gautama the contemplative so mighty so powerful come now prince go to gautama the contemplative and on arrival say this lord would the tathagat say words that are unendearing and disagreeable to others if gautama the contemplative thus asked answers the tathagat would say words that are unendearing and disagreeable to others then you should say then how is there any difference between you lord and run of the mill people for even run of the mill people say words that are unendearing and disagreeable to others but if gautama the contemplative thus asked answers the tathagat would not say words that are unendearing and disagreeable to others then you should say then how lord did you say of devdatt that devdatt is headed for destitution devdatt is headed for hell he will boil for an eon he is incurable for devdatt was upset and disgruntled at those words of yours just for some context so devdatt was a cousin of the buddha and as per the uh, accounts of devdatt uh, he developed some psychic powers and uh, that corrupted his uh, thinking he became very ambitious he wanted to displace the buddha and he got involved in a lot of uh, political intrigue to make that happen uh, gautama uh, denounced him saying that uh, the actions that you are doing are setting you down a path of unending suffering so that is what uh, the nigantanath put this uh, referring to that uh, you denounced devdatt and he was upset and disgruntled at these words of yours so what they're trying to do is uh, trying to put the buddha in a position that he is not able to answer one way or the other when gautama the contemplative is asked this two pronged question by you he won't be able to swallow it down or spit it out just as if a two horned chestnut was stuck in a man's throat he would not be able to swallow it down or spit it out in the same way when gautama the contemplative is asked this two prong question by you he won't be able to swallow it down or spit it out responding as you say venerable sir prince abhay got up from his seat he bowed down to nigantanathaput circumambulated him and then went to the blessed one on arrival he bowed down to the blessed one and sat to one side as he was sitting there he glanced up at the sun and thought today is not the time to refute the blessed one's words tomorrow in my own home i will overturn the blessed one's words so he said to the blessed one may the blessed one together with three others acquiesce to my offer of tomorrow's meal the blessed one acquiesced with silence then prince abhay understanding the blessed one's acquiescence got up from his seat bowed to the blessed one circumambulated him and left then after the night had passed the blessed one early in the morning put on his robes and carrying his bowl and outer robe went to prince abhay's home on arrival he sat down on a seat made ready prince abhay with his own hand served and satisfied the blessed one with fine stable and non stable foods then when the blessed one had eaten and had removed his hand from his bowl prince abhay took a lower seat and sat to one side as he was sitting there he said to the blessed one lord would the tathagat say words that are unendearing and disagreeable to others 
So the Buddha responds to this. Prince, there is no categorical yes or no answer to that. Then right here, Lord, the Nigantas are destroyed. So the Buddha obviously doesn't know the context of uh, the previous conversation. And he asks, but Prince, why do you say? Then right here, Lord, the Nigantas are destroyed. Just yesterday, Lord, I went to Niganta Nathaput and he said to me, come now, Prince, go to Kautama, the contemplative and on arrival, say this, Lord, would the Tathagat say words that are unendearing and disagreeable to others. Just as if a two horned chestnut was stuck in a man's throat, he would not be able to swallow it down or spit it up. In the same way, when Gautama the contemplative is asked this two prong question by you, he won't be able to swallow it down or spit it up. So right uh, from the way the Buddha answered this question, right? he says, Prince, there is no categorical yes or no answer. So that is one of the first things that we can learn from this sutta. A lot of times we try to answer questions without understanding whether the questions are framed correctly or does their framing limit the answer to be say a yes or no answer or to be another type of answer. So it is the Buddha's wisdom that helps him to understand that this is not a question that can be answered categorically as a yes or no. So he goes on. At that time, a baby boy was lying face up on the prince's lap. So the blessed one said to the prince, what do you think prince? If this young boy through your own negligence or that of the nurse were to take a stick or a piece of gravel into its mouth, what would you do? I would take it out, Lord, if I couldn't get it out right away. Then holding its head in my left hand and crooking a finger of my right, I would take it out. Even if it meant drawing blood. Why is that? Because I have compassion for the young boy. So the Prince Abhay says, uh, if there was something stuck, a stone or a stick, in the child's mouth, he would take it out. And if he couldn't take it out easily, even if he has to do it with a bit of force that may result in drawing blood, he would do it. Why is that? Because he has compassion for the young boy, because he wants a good outcome for the young boy. In the same way, Prince, in the case of words that the Tathagat knows, to be unfactual, untrue, unbeneficial, unendearing and disagreeable to others. He does not say. That. So the Buddha here is looking at any statement through multiple lenses. It says, is it factual? He's saying something correctly. Is it true? Is it the truth or untruth? Is it beneficial? Is it going to lead to good outcomes, good consequences? Beneficial can also be said as connected to the spiritual goal. Is this going to help people move forward in their spiritual goals? Unendearing and disagreeable. These are the cases where he, after looking at words, that he wishes to say or that need to be said at some point. He puts them through these tests and does not say them. Do we end up saying these things? Unfactual, untrue, unbeneficial, unendearing, disagreeable. When do we end up saying these things? And why do we end up saying, saying these things? This is an interesting thing that we look at. What makes us say unfactual, untrue, unbeneficial, unendearing and disagreeable things. How do we become cognizant of our tendencies to say these? And how do we 
develop the mindfulness to avoid saying such things. This is the first thing that the Tathagat says. In the case of words that the Tathagat knows to be factual, true, factual as well as true, unbeneficial, unendearing and disagreeable to others, he does not say them. Even if something is factual and true, but it is unbeneficial, it creates suffering for yourself, for the other person or for any other person. Unendearing and disagreeable, the Tathagat does not uh, say that. So what can be an example of something that is factual and true, but unbeneficial? It could be gossip, for instance. A person said something about another person. You can go and report that and create a division between them, create a rift between them. That would be factual, true, but unbeneficial, unendearing and disagreeable to others. Just one example. There could be many other examples. In the case of words that the Tathakal, Tathagat knows, to be factual, true, beneficial, but unendearing and disagreeable to others, he has a sense of the proper time for saying that. If it is factual, true, as well as beneficial, however, what the words, the words that are factual, true, and beneficial are not endearing, not agreeable to the other person. The Tathagat doesn't jump the gun and say, I need to say this because it is true, because it is factual and beneficial. He has a sense of the proper time for saying that. Why is this proper time important? So that it can actually be beneficial. So the other person is actually in a receptive state. This is a very important statement. It doesn't mean that you have to be a people pleaser all the time. Just say things that are endearing and disagreeable to other people. You can say things that are unendearing and disagreeable if they are factual, they're true and they're beneficial for the other person. But there is only one case that can lead to good consequences, wholesome consequences from this, which is by understanding, identifying the proper time the proper way for saying these things. Even in this uh, episode, we can see the Prince Abhay came. He came with an intention of besting the Buddha. And let me say something smart and tricky and lure the Buddha into a trap. Although he came from that uh, perspective, the Tathagat didn't want to prove him wrong. In fact, he allowed the prince to use the example of the young boy to say, give an answer about how he would treat the young boy because he has compassion, even though it is not a simple yes or no answer. Once he has allowed the prince to say this thing, he uses the same analogy to say how things, how words can be said, even if they are unendearing and disagreeable, as long as they are factual, true and beneficial. So the Buddha identified the proper time, the proper context where he could say this and it would actually register with the prince. It would help him understand, it would help him with his understanding of the Dhamma. It would help him with advancing on the spiritual path without simply feeling that he has been defeated in his mission. So this is the third case. The fourth case, in the case of words that the Tathagat knows to be unfactual, untrue, unbeneficial, but endearing and agreeable to others. He does not say them. So what can be an example of this? Unfactual, untrue, unbeneficial but endearing and agreeable to others. Spreading rumors, spreading lies, saying 
this person did this whether or not there is any basis to that purely from some kind of sadistic pleasure or to flattery also <laughs> achieve some kind of uh, short term outcome flattering someone so that uh, as you mentioned flattering someone to get their favor for instance so this is the fourth case in the case of words that the tathagat knows to be unfactual untrue unbeneficial but endearing and agreeable to others he does not say that. the fifth case in the case of words that the tathagat knows to be factual true unbeneficial but endearing and agreeable to others he does not say flattery could be another uh, example in this case it could be factual it could be true but maybe all it does is serve the other person to become more egoistic more identified with the certain qualities that you have you know praised to flatter them but it is not really beneficial it is not helping them to grow it is not helping them to improve their understanding however it is endearing and agreeable so as long as it is unbeneficial even if it is factual true endearing and agreeable the tathagat does not say that. in the case of words that the tathagat knows to be factual true beneficial as well as endearing and agreeable to others he has a sense of the proper time for saying them so even if something is factual it is true it is beneficial as well as endearing and agreeable the tathagat has a right sense of time why is this sense of time important again does this lead to the person something endearing and agreeable that you are telling a person does it lead to their benefit it may at a certain stage at a certain occasion it may just inflate their ego at a certain occasion it may give them confidence to do the right thing so by identifying the right time the right occasion the right context for saying that you can ensure that it is beneficial why is that now the tathagat the buddha draws an analogy with the prince abhay's own answer right he says the prince abhay said i will pull out this stone or stick from the child's throat even if it means drawing blood using that analogy having brought prince abhay to that point he says why is that because the tathagat has compassion for all living beings why does the tathagat follow this these kind of principles because he has compassion for all living beings just quickly i will uh, uh, let me just summarize the different things that the tathagat uses to understand whether something should be said and when it should be said whether it is factual and true so that is the first thing that the tathagat looks at in fact if we look at these cases that the tathagat has talked about he does not even entertain the case that something can be unfactual and untrue yet be beneficial many times we feel that we are uh, you know speaking the untruth because it is beneficial that is just our uh, we are conveniently deceiving ourselves when we say that so unfactual and untrue is not acceptable unbeneficial is also not acceptable don't say anything that may create suffering for yourself that may create suffering for the other person don't say things that are meaningless or trivial not really helping the other person towards good outcomes in their lives right so that is the other lens that uh, the buddha uses and finally about endearing and agreeable the buddha doesn't say that we should only restrict ourselves to saying things that are endearing and agreeable we don't need to be people pleasers but we need to have 
develop the right sense of time the right sense of occasion the right sense of context when something can be said whether it is endearing and agreeable whether it is unendearing and disagreeable in either case when it is administered at the right time it will be beneficial and help ourselves as well as the other person make the right kind of progress so when the buddha says this when sabha says lord when wise nobles or brahmans householders or contemplatives having formulated questions come to the tathagat and ask him does this line of reasoning appear to his awareness beforehand that if those who approach me ask this i thus asked will answer in this way or does the tathagat comes up come up with the answer on the spot so prince abhay says uh, are you have you already prepared a list of frequently asked questions that you have the answers for and you have anticipated people are going to ask certain questions and you just give the answer because you already prepared with it is that the case or is it that you come up with the answer the answer up occurs to you appears to you on the spot in that case prince says the tathagat i will ask you a counter question answer as you see fit what do you think are you skilled in the parts of a chariot yes lord i am skilled in the parts of a chariot and what do you think when people come and ask you what is the name of this part of the chariot does this line of reasoning appear to your awareness beforehand if those who approach me ask this i thus asked will answer in this way or do you come up with the answer on the spot so the buddha responds with a counter question lord i am renowned for being skilled in the parts of a chariot all the parts of a chariot are well known to me i come up with the answer on the spot in the same way prince when wise nobles or brahmans householders or contemplatives having formulated questions come to the tathagat and ask him he comes up with the answer on the spot why is that because the property of the dhamma is thoroughly comprehended by the tathagat from his thorough penetration of the property of the dhamma he comes up with the answer on the spot so the buddha says i do not need to memorize a list of frequently asked questions it is because of my thorough comprehension thorough understanding of the dhamma of the way phenomena occur in our minds how do how does conscious experience occur how do mental phenomena occur how do we experience things because of the comprehensive understanding of this the answer appears on the spot when this was said prince abhay said to the blessed one magnificent lord magnificent just as if he were to place upright what was overturned to reveal what was hidden to show the way to one who was lost or to carry a lamp into the dark so that those with eyes could see forms in the same way has the blessed one through many lines of reasoning made the dhamma clear i go to the blessed one for refuge to the dhamma and to the sangha of the monks may the blessed one remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge from this day forward for life that is the end of the sutta i would just like to make Sad a few comments <laughs> okay uh, do the q and a yeah we should ask uh, questions and uh, if it is not related to this you can ask question about uh, meditation uh, or uh, twin topics
somebody must have questions any any clarifications about speech or uh, about uh, meditation because we get always a new perspective by asking questions you know uh, from a new perspective we'll get an answer so i would request uh, uh, people to ask uh, questions let me add a few comments to the sutta and maybe some questions will come forth from that so one of the interesting things about this sutta is uh, the buddha doesn't just give a set of principles for right speech but he actually demonstrates right speech in action here uh, prince abhay comes to him with the intention of outsmarting him or luring him into a trap however like the tathagat says because i i have sympathy for all living beings i have compassion for all living beings what he does is he tells him things that are factual true and beneficial to him and he presents it in a way that it becomes endearing and agreeable so even though the perspective of coming and getting defeated in a debate or not getting the outcome that he came with in his mind even though that is defeated he still manages to pass on the buddha manages to pass on the benefit of this conversation to prince abhay so that is one uh, very interesting thing to be able to see right speech in action in this sutta the other important part is the question that is uh, asked towards the end right? so when prince abhay asks do you anticipate and memorize answers to certain questions or do these appear to you on the spot so this uh, talks about a very important point which is developing your intuition being able to identify what is the wholesome what is the skillful action to be taken whether it is a mental action or a verbal action or a bodily action in any setting so once we start building that intuition building that wisdom we are able to automatically come up with the right action the right speech at any point of time how do we develop this intuition so this is where the practice really becomes important even in terms of precepts people will always come up with different uh, specific cases does this precept apply here does this precept apply there eventually you cannot apply precepts you cannot apply these concepts in simply as a set of rules set of memorizations about what is right what is wrong what the buddha said in this sutta or another sutta you have to understand what is appropriate what is beneficial what is wholesome for the situation and how do you do that this is like i said this is where the practice comes in two things that are important in the practice right mindfulness so we develop our mindfulness when we do our sitting we learn to observe where our attention is how is it moving from one thing to another and how it often moves with an underlying base, basis of craving it an underlying basis of i like it i don't like it i want one outcome i don't want one outcome when we get identified and attached with something the craving that underlies that thought goes up when we develop our mindfulness through our practice we are able to see how our attention has moved to a certain object to a certain thought to a certain state of mind with craving with tension and tightness in our mind when we use the six hours right effort we are able to identify that this craving has attached us our attention to this particular thought process 
to this particular topic, we are able to diffuse that craving. We are able to recognize it. We are able to let that thought be not identified with it. We are able to relax the tension and tightness and reduce the craving that is in our mind with respect to that thought. We are able to use our smile to bring up a wholesome state of mind and we are able to return back to the object of meditation. So these two abilities, right? Mindfulness, being able to identify the movement of attention, being able to identify when our attention has become personally attached to a thought, to a situation. It has become identified with that situation. And we are now trying to protect that identity. So when that has happened, the ability to detect that is right mindfulness, samasati, that is uh, developed as we do our practice. Every time we recognize in our meditation that our mind has wandered away and we use the six hours, we are teaching our mind that it, it is important to observe, to remember to observe how our attention moves from one thing to another. The second thing that we do is when we identify that our mind has become attached and identified with a certain thought, we develop the ability to gently and skillfully bring our attention back to a wholesome place while diffusing the craving in that situation. So when we use that six hour. As we keep doing this, we start building our intuition that we start identifying what are the things we are attached to? What are the things that get us agitated? What are the things that get us emotional? Like I mentioned right in the beginning, the first point that the Tathagat says. In the case of words that the Tathagat knows to be unfactual, untrue, unbeneficial, unendearing and disagreeable, he does not say that. What is the reason that we end up saying such things? Why do we say unfactual things? Why do we say untrue things? Why do we say unbeneficial things? Why do we say things that are unendearing or disagreeable? We say these because our mind is trapped in a situation with a deep sense of craving and attachment. We are completely, our attention, our mind, our thinking is hijacked by I like it, I don't like it. I want an outcome, I don't want a certain outcome. It becomes hijacked by fear that if I say the truth, I may get in trouble. I may get someone else in trouble. If I say something factual, I may not get the outcome that I need. So that fear, it can be fear, it can be greed to get an outcome, it can be hatred for a certain outcome. It can be delusion, you just simply become occupied in the defense of yourself, right? So those things are all happening on the basis of craving that has gone undetected, that has kept growing as our attention is on an object with craving, with personalization, with identification, with attachment that keeps on growing and makes us feel that there is no option but to say unfactual, untrue, unbeneficial, unendearing and disagreeable things. So as we learn to identify this, as we sharpen our mindfulness and just identifying it is not enough, we need to be able to skillfully and gently bring our attention back without craving to a wholesome state. So as we do that, we teach our mind that there is a different way to respond to that situation. We don't necessarily have to react in a very personally identified reactive, habitual way to a situation. But there is a way to look at that situation, put a little bit of distance between you and that situation, see what is factual, what is true, and what is beneficial. See what is the right time to say something, or whether it is the right time to just keep mum, to be able to identify that. So that is how we develop the skills that are required for right speech, which is right mindfulness and right effort. And that is how we develop our wisdom and intuition. Just like Prince Abhay understands the chariot and the Buddha understands the Dhamma. 
you will not be able to look at a remember the right rule that applies to a situation through your daily life but by teaching our mind to respond to situations without craving without attachment without identification without greed without hatred without fear without delusion as we teach our mind again and again it starts learning it starts learning and building this new habit it starts also building its own wisdom by seeing how wholesome actions taken by us without craving lead to good good consequences for ourselves and for others and unwholesome actions that we take lead to unhappy outcomes for ourselves as well as for others just wanted to add that comment for this beautiful sutta excuse me rajiv at the very beginning of that comment thank you that was really really, really interesting the very beginning of that comment you made a, you made mention of something about how in meditation observing how the mind has moved onto another object my question is is that not the same as when the mind has moved what's the difference between how observing how the mind has moved and then observing when the mind has moved because they seem to me to be almost the same thing it's a very uh, interesting question so there are two things that you will learn so in my mind when i say how it also subsumes the when so how things are happening subsumes the when but why is how the right way to think about it because when your mind is on one object right so if you look at your experience of life you could be sitting here right now you could not be paying attention to the screen you could be distracted by something else that's happening around you that would be your experience of life many times many of us would have experienced it in our classrooms 10 students sitting in the same space absorbing very different things about life going through very different experiences of life right so what happens is uh, our entire experience of life is our attention being on one object okay and there is an awareness of other things that are happening right so if you're sitting and uh, a lion comes running from right in front of you your attention will go there it won't get stuck there. so there is a peripheral attention of what's happening and whenever something is deemed to be important either it gives me a good outcome it uh, gives me something positive or it is something that i need that i'm fearful about something that may for example threaten my survival so your attention moves from this to another thing right so if you are going in disneyland or some amusement park right so your mind is scanning what is the most interesting thing i can do next right? it is uh, looking for different things so your attention moves from one thing to another now what happens is this attention doesn't isn't suddenly on object a and then it doesn't suddenly go to object b there is a process where the attention it's on object a and it starts to wobble it is getting signals that there is something else which is either very attractive or very repulsive or fearsome in the environment right so your mind starts to first see that signal it starts wobbling and as it starts if it thinks that that thing is more important than what my mind is on right now. so you are looking at the screen right now a lion comes running in front of you you know your mind says hey this is more important as it starts going towards the other object what happens is in this uh, during this journey where it starts wobbling says that hey this is maybe not the most important thing in my life in my surroundings right now and this is while making that movement what it is also doing is it is generating it is predicting the world around you it is generating an entire understanding of the universe right so you are moving from one place and you are while you are trying to interpret the other thing right so if it was a actually a lion stuffed toy at some point you will realize that this is not really dangerous to me but if it is an actual lion you will realize that it is dangerous so you are constructing your mind is constructing and predicting what the world is and what that outcome means for you right so when i say how as you go deeper into the meditation as your mind becomes very still goes deep it starts seeing the different steps that are taken from going from one object 
to another and that kind of the journey that you take from point a to point b is the same journey same kind of journey that you'll take from point b to point c to point d and so on and that will be the experience of your life right so you want to see what happened not only when an attention was attached to object a you want to also see how it went from object a to object b and how it stayed there. so by that you are kind of mapping the entire journey of your conscious experience of your experience of life so how you know for in a moment you can go from a man to a person of a certain religion to a person who owns a certain say a car you know you are uh, traveling on the road you are uh, maybe thinking about your occupation you are thinking about your workplace and suddenly somebody cuts you off in the road now you are you assume the person of somebody who is coexisting with another person on the road and the other person is misbehaving with you right then you get a call from home right so you have gone from a workplace person you have gone to a person who is uh, you know two drivers on the road and then you get a call from home maybe you have to assume the role of a father right so all those things are happening so as your attention moves from one thing to another it is changing your context it is defining who you are it is defining what the world is it is defining whether the things that are happening are beneficial to you or are they not beneficial to you and typically it is making you react in a very myopic kind of way when you start understanding that hey my mind created this construct of things my mind created this persona i can choose to act in a wholesome way i don't need to react in a habitual way that is the understanding we want to do and that understanding comes when we start seeing this process for ourselves no matter how much i intellectualize it for you how much i lay it out for you when you start seeing in your own practice how your mind goes from how your attention goes from one object to another you see that entire activity that is repeating that from getting a signal that says hey we need to pay attention to this other thing that is happening in our environment from that you create a context we create concepts of what that other thing is what you how you feel about it whether you like it whether you don't like it whether you want a certain outcome from it or not and who you are with relation to that other object am i a father am i a man am i a indian am i an american am i a uh, you know member of a certain community or a religion so you're defining all that uh, during that journey from point a to point b so that is why i say observe how attention moves thank you that was a great answer thank you very much Hi Rajiv. Hi Ben. Uh, thank you for your Dhamma talk. It was very insightful for me. Um, I have a question about entering the jhanas. You know, when when I practice, when I do the six hours, and when I uh, put my mind on the object that is meta for me, mm -hmm. um, it seems that nothing else happens. I don't. go deeper than that so my question is uh, is this uh, is there something wrong with me or do we need to do something more besides putting our mind on the object or uh, i don't know uh right now just uh, benam if you can tell me uh, your object is sending metta to a spiritual friend is that correct uh yes Okay, and uh, how did you get started uh, with the practice? Have you attended any retreat online or physical, or uh, you've read a book, or you've attended a session? Uh, I read all the books written by uh, Bhante Vimalarmsi. Also, I did the uh, self-directed uh, online, you know, retreat. Mm -hmm. um, also, I've been attending all the you know sessions with Sister Kemo and. Uh, she guided me you know and it me to go deeper okay and i've uh, been practice for four months each day every day three hours or more maybe three hours uh, of uh, okay 
and uh, how long do you sit in one sitting it depends sometimes one hour one hour 10 minutes sometimes less maybe 50 minutes okay i will need to ask you a bunch of other questions to understand your practice uh, if you want uh, maybe at the end of the session we can uh, connect because this will be very specific to how you are using the technique and if we need to fine tune that what i would recommend the other thing you should look at is to uh, do an online retreat right so for eight or nine days you would have a guide me or uh, one of the other guides at uh, damasuka we would be able to ask you those questions and fine tune your practice for a period of nine days i think that will be very beneficial for you so there are uh, there may be some application of technique that needs to be refined, right? So we can either connect after this uh, call. I will share my details over here and uh, we can either discuss uh, separately, but I would also recommend, uh, you know, go through that nine day retreat. It is a good structured format. You will get daily, uh, you know, daily inputs into your technique and that will be very beneficial. Okay, if you have free time, I will be glad to connect with you after the session. Sure, I will. Thank uh, you very much. My phone number, you can maybe drop me a WhatsApp message and I'll be happy to talk to you. Okay, thank you very much. If you have your personal Zoom, you can give your Zoom uh, to him uh, and you can have a Zoom meeting. If you yeah. have a, uh, yeah, or you can take this Zoom also. We can mm. uh, exit and you can uh, kind of talk, whatever is convenient. Yeah, yeah. I think we can okay. uh, connect on WhatsApp, might be oh. easy. So any other questions? Sarah, you have anything? Hello, everyone. Thank you for the talk. Um, yeah, so a reflection and a question around the timing of when we say things. Um, this seems to be very interesting because we can look to um, become much more aware of our own uh, place from which we're communicating. But there's also the, the place at which other people are able to receive information. So I thought it might be interesting to hear um, thoughts about timing uh, for how to, how to wisely communicate uh, for beneficial outcome. Yeah. Uh, so Sarah, uh, this comes in the category of Prince Abhay's question about do you prepare yourself with answers expecting people to come up with a certain question. So it is very difficult to anticipate the infinite complexity of situations that might come in life. But what is really important in terms of what we talked about time. So when the Buddha lays out these different principles, what does he say? And he says that there is one reason underlying why I chose to choose my words like this. He says, because I have compassion for all living beings. So what we need to understand most importantly is in any situation, when we are responding, are we doing that to achieve a short term outcome for us? Are we doing it from a place of agitation, of being emotionally unsettled? of being of greed, hatred, fear, delusion, right? So are, is there, and how do you identify this? You ident start with your practice, you start becoming more familiar with the craving that is in your mind. So if you note that anything that you're about to say, that you're preparing to say, for instance, is accompanied with that tension and tightness, with that craving in your mind, then you know that it is not an action that you're taking out of compassion. It is an action that you're taking because you like that or you don't like that. You want that outcome or you don't want that out. That is the underlying basis. So being able to identify that 
being able to diffuse that craving in that moment and being able to take the action with a mind that is full of compassion for the other people that are involved that are affected by that you will have to grow this intuition over time so skill is something that you have to grow over time there are no edicts no set of rules that will help you identify it is a tight rope that we have to walk and we have to get more skillful at it what we can do as we keep identifying as we improve our mindfulness as we keep improving our ability to identify the craving and as we keep improving our ability to skillfully diffuse the craving and work act in a wholesome way our mind keeps learning it builds that intuition it builds that skill and then our actions being able to take the right compassionate action becomes more and more natural for us so that is the only thing that is really that you can practice the other thing you can do is reflect so any time uh you say something that you are able to see was said from a place of being very personally identified from being very emotional agitated you can see how the craving made you know took you to that place you can reflect on that and make a determination to yourself to be more mindful in the future the rest is practicing practice those muscles become more mindful and practice right effort so that it becomes second nature to you and maybe first nature <laughs> some day thank you so much any more questions so uh, should we end this uh, now uh, we can share the merits and uh, it's also one hour that is our kind of uh, target time so or uh, we can continue if you have anybody has any questions you want to add anything uh, uh, rajiv mm. nothing i think we can share merit i have shared my uh, phone number i will also share my email address in case anyone has uh, any questions yeah. and uh, whenever uh, bante feels is a good time i'll be happy to come again with and have a discussion on another yeah topic. so we will keep on kind of uh, having uh, other uh, sessions also and we'll be uh, inviting uh, uh, rajiv uh, Maybe uh, uh, one of those Wednesdays also session because that there, there is a different group of people kind of a uh, little bit. Uh, so we'll uh, invite you because because of the time also uh, Wednesday has a little bit uh, different people. So we can uh, kind of invite you over there. So we'll share the merits now. May suffering once be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings sh share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu.